Hello my beautiful co-creators, Lilu here in beautiful Santa Fe, New Mexico and I'm today with Sandra Ingerman. Hello Sandra. Thanks for visiting me. It's <laughs> awesome to visit you here in Santa Fe yeah. and uh, do this interview in person instead That's of right. Skype. Yes much more pleasant <laughs> yeah and intimate I love that yeah thank yeah. you mm -hmm. um, for the ones of you that don't know Sandra yet um, she's you're teaching on an international internationally workshops mm -hmm. um, and you wrote over eight books that's right and those are your two little latest babies that's right <laughs> how to strive in changing times and awakening to the spirit world and this is very much the topic that I wanted to talk to you about because a lot of us a lot of things are changing around us right now rapidly mm -hmm. and it seems like part of that is to awaken our spirit exactly can you tell us why why are we all confronted right now this period of time uh, with all some an old world seems to be collapsing how I write about it um, and how I speak about it is if you think about a weaving um, our whole fabric of reality right now is unweaving, it's dissolving right in front of our eyes. And in, in all change, every change involves a death. But what scares people and what people really need to remember is that death is not an end. It's a beginning. It's a transition. It's a transition into something new, a healthier way of life. And so what has been unhealthy and disharmonious for the planet itself is starting to unweave. Mm -hmm. And then for us, it's to be the new dreamers to start to weave that new fabric of reality into being that creates more of our harmonious life for ourselves on a personal level, but on a global and planetary level too. Mm -hmm. And, and, and this will, you're saying it's going to awaken our spirit and we need that right now in this period of time? Absolutely. Um, I think that in the modern Western world, what happened is we became so focused on um, our bodies and our minds. Um, the rational mm -hmm. you know, is, is what's encouraged and is what's validated. And yeah. we've forgotten that we're body, mind, and spirit. And the spirit part of ourselves is the um, all-knowing part of ourselves. It's where the divine in us lives. It's where all the deep mysteries live. And so I think that what is being called for right now in order for us to survive and thrive mm -hmm. on the planet is for us to tap back into that deep inner wisdom and those deep mysteries. And that means tapping back into the spiritual part of ourselves. But the spiritual is an invisible part. It's not tangible. And in a world that validates the rational, um, everybody goes, well, how do you validate that? You know, what are the results? Um, yeah. What's the scientific proof? And on some levels, if we look at it, it's science. Science is wonderful and has brought beautiful things to the world and modern technology. We love it. But science really has created an unsustainable environment for us. So the time is calling for us to tap into that spiritual wisdom, um, the deep mysteries, to be able to come up with the solutions of how to reweave that fabric um, mm. into being. Yeah, and a new world can then be created from, right. from something else than just the academic, but from something extraordinarily knowledgeable mm -hmm. and connected to each and everything. Well, it's we the, forgot it's, that connection. We forgot the connection and it's the bridging. Um, and a lot of the work that I've been teaching, I've been saying it's not about getting rid of anything. Mm -hmm. It's about starting to bridge spirituality into science so that uh, we can co-create together um, a harmonious planet. Because mm, you have done a lot of studies and you have also a scientific background, haven't you? I have my BA in marine biology and um, I, I've always loved working with people so I didn't end up um, following too much the scientific route. But I have an, an incredible love of nature and, and it really um, 
has hurt. Um, it's a bit depressing to see what's happened to our environment. So a lot of the focus of my work has been how do we bring back those ancient spiritual principles and how did ancient teachers and masters and mystics perform miracles mm -hmm. and how can we bring that knowledge back today to create miraculous healings for not just on a personal level but for the environment itself yeah and um, and it can be done. And that's, you know, if I, there was anything I, I'd like to put out to the world is, is not to give up hope. It can be done. It can be transformed. We just have to learn how to shift our attitudes, our beliefs, how we talk about what's happening on yeah. the planet, and not to be afraid. And is it just a matter of bringing the Asian teachings into this world or re-adapting them? Well, it's both. Uh, there's a lot of um, ancient teachings that are really core of all religions and spiritual practices that are, are um, being taught today. And at the same time, I'm a psychotherapist, so a lot of my work has been how do we bridge some of those ancient teachings into a modern day, yeah. psychologically sophisticated world yeah. to be able to help people and the problems that we're dealing with today because as long as the world has been in existence there have been challenges and issues that's part of nature sometimes you're flowing down the river and it's smooth and beautiful and the sun is out and sometimes you're flowing down the river and it's turbulent yeah and that's just part of nature so we're not really seeing anything different than has ever been in the world it's just we're alive now, we're here today, and we're going through some turbulent times. And so what, what's the knowledge that can help us to learn how to build a good boat mm -hmm. to get us through those turbulent times, knowing that there's a bright future ahead? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what are some of those elements from those Asian teachings that you think are important for us to re-anchor in our society? Well, um, one of the, if you look at every spiritual tradition and every major religion, it's taught that everything begins in the invisible worlds before it manifests into the physical. And, and the point of that is that the spiritual practices that we get involved in today are where we have power to create change. Because people feel very disempowered. Yeah. What can I do as one person? by finding a spiritual practice that calls to you personally that that your heart is happy practicing um, that makes a difference and um, another basic spiritual principle and the wording comes from alchemy is as above so below as mm. within so without and basically what that means is that everything in our outer world is a reflection of our inner state of consciousness so if you want to actually change the outer world, you have to change yourself. And we all, yeah. want, we all want to make change. Isn't there a pill we can take or isn't there yeah. something we can do? And, um, but it's exciting work. And um, from a spiritual perspective, our thoughts are part of that inner world. Are you repeating throughout the day? Things have gone too far. Um, People haven't been treating the planet well. They don't deserve to live any. You know, these are things that you hear. Um, it's impossible to create change at this particular point. Things are terrible. They always have been terrible for me. They always will be. These are things, and I, I love to use um, the image of a train um, to help us understand our thoughts. We use in, in a Western world the term train of thought. And that means that your thoughts are going to lead you to a particular station. Mm -hmm. And so we <laughs> have to become um, conscious of what are those thoughts that keep looping yeah. inside of us um, throughout the day. And where is that going to lead us? Are mm -hmm. those thoughts going to lead us to our desired outcome? Mm -hmm. um, what are our beliefs and learning how to shift those around? What are the words that we're using throughout the day? Because in spiritual traditions, words are seen to be magic. 
Mm. Um, abracadabra, which we used to say as little children, abracadabra. Abracadabra is actually an Aramaic phrase, and it literally translates to, I will create as I speak. Mm. And most creation myths around the world, or the world was created from a sound or a word, you know, different cultures believe that words are magic, words are seeds. You plant them in the ground, they're going to grow into something. And uh, there's a wonderful science that started around in the 1930s, 1940s, but um, it was never validated and it's really becoming very popular today and it's called uh, neuroplasticity. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it shows that the brain is flexible. It's not as rigid as people once thought it um, to be. So um, from a neuroplasticity point of view, if you keep on saying the world has gone too far, the world has gone too far, you actually create in your brain, mm. um, like where a sled would go, certain tracks and what we need to learn how to do is to actually pick up the sled and move it so that our actual brain activity will start to help us to take the action that we all need to take to change the world that we live in. But again, it starts with us and it goes back to that as within is the thoughts that we have. Mm -hmm. And we can um, use, make our brain a partner in our work by learning how to create tracks that lead us to our desired outcome. Mm, new pathways. New huh? pathways. We yeah. can literally rewire our brain. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly. phenomenal. Yeah, and one of the things um, I've been having people do recently, because people start to say this is too hard, I don't even know where to begin, yeah. is <clears throat> think about a really simple memory like the first time you ever had ice cream mm. or the first time you saw snow um you know or the playing with animals as playing a kid with animals mm. or, or a smell of a beautiful rose this actually although it sounds very simple it actually starts to change those neural pathways in the brain so meditation is very effective in this way mm -hmm. using your imagination and I think that what people don't understand is we were born with this incredible gift of imagination. And if you look at one of the basic teachings of um, spirituality, it's that we are dreaming the world that we're living yeah. in. And shamans around the world have been saying we're dreaming the wrong dream. Mm. And how we dream is with our imagination. Can you actually imagine a world that where the waters are clean and the air is clean and that people are equal and that we respect all of life and you know all the things yeah. that go along with a healthy world it starts with our imagination because we're we're actually dreaming the world into being all mm. the time so part of doing there's that but there's also the, the whole part of healing our thoughts that you're saying right. that's really important <clears throat> it's very important and, you know, as a psychotherapist, I think it's important for us to not deny what we're feeling. Um, it's important for us to accept, to say, well, life isn't good. It doesn't feel good right now. The violence doesn't feel good. The pollution doesn't feel good. I don't feel healthy, you know, in the life that I've created. You know, whatever's going on, acknowledge it. Don't deny it. Mm -hmm. Um, but then, step number you, one. Step number one, you know, acknowledge what's yeah. happening, but then start to work slowly with reframing your thoughts of things don't feel so good now, but all change is possible. Mm -hmm. We can do this. Mm -hmm. And as a global community, we can come together to create change. Um, there's so much more that we can do as a community than we can do as individuals. So a lot of the basis of um, the work that I work with, it's who you become that changes the world, not what you do. Because as you learn how to create an inner state mm -hmm. that's healthy, harmonious, joyful, 
um, that's where we're going to see those adder changes. And if you look at um, some of the indigenous people around the world, um, from a modern perspective, you look at their lives, they have nothing. But there's a light, there's a joy coming out of their eyes that Westerners would do anything <laughs> to have that light, to have that joy. And when you spend time with these people, they have such a rich inner world. That joy is coming from within. It's not how many material possessions can you co collect or how much money or you know, all the things in the West, we keep on thinking mm. if I, you know, get one more thing. Then I'll be car, happier. New, I'll be happier. Mm. And then you get it and, <laughs> you know, it, the excitement <laughs> lasts for a few days. But um, to really um, have true joy, true health, true wealth, that's an inner state. That's not an outer state. And so as the world is kind of dissolving around us, I think that people are starting to be pushed mm. inside to start to rework their inner state and to find the richness of their inner garden mm. and, the, and their soul. So is there much for us to do or is it really a place we should be contemplating the world and being joyful and opening our heart and that's all what there is to do and for us to be willing to receive and let that inner beauty shine out or is it really a <coughs> co-creation or how does this work for you? Well, I think it's both. I think um, part of it is, first of all, we're, we're in a bad habit. Our thoughts, the words that we use are habitual. So what I like to do is, like on my desk in my office, I have little post-its of words that I can see to remind myself to um, incorporate these words into my language. Like, I love the word radiance. Mm. You know, when you say the word radiance or yeah. brilliance, you can actually feel a vibration, mm -hmm. an expansive vibration. Mm -hmm. So I remind myself. Um, I have uh, pictures of nature, things that remind me that I want to work in behalf of the planet, um, little notes to myself in different places, mm -hmm. um, uh, don't send negative thoughts into the world, transform your thoughts, mm -hmm. um, express it, don't send it, you know, I have little notes around. <laughs> so we're in a bad habit, so these inner states, um, using our imagination to start to dream the world that we do want to live in, instead of to keep dreaming what we don't want in our lives, um, that's part of the work. And then, um, a lot of my background is in shamanism and the indigenous point of view. And then we have to take action also in the world to live from a place of honor and respect. You know, we feel in a modern day culture, and this is where the rational and the scientific um, has come in to um, have us avoid feeling connected uh, with nature. We are part of nature. We're not separate from mm. nature. We're part of everything that's alive. We're part of a web of life. And so to be, get, to be able to get up in the morning and give thanks for your life, that's an action that we take. Um, to acknowledge that it's the earth and the air and water and the sun that are actually bringing us food and life, not the grocery stores. Um, that is an action, a simple action we can take that, that has huge mm. um, potential for change on the planet. These are simple things that we can do. And our perception really does create our reality. Yeah. And so it's really important for us to keep searching for what is the beauty of life and what do I have to feel gratitude for and being appreciation for. And then that forms um, a, a basis, a path that starts to lead to a different way of living. So these are things on an, as far as an outer practice um, that we can start to work with are important to add to the spiritual work that we do. Mm. But you're also saying as a shaman that uh, part of your job is to bring pieces of soul that were lost mm -hmm. and that we need to retrieve so that we can fully be ourselves and shine even more light. Right. 
<clears throat> and that's an important portion of it's, your work too and what you're very important because from a, a classical shamanic point of view and we're talking about cross-cultural one of the major causes of illness is what's called soul loss and uh, soul is our essence it's our vi vitality it's that part of ourselves that keeps us alive and we whenever we suffer an emotional or physical trauma it's believed that a piece of our soul dissociates from our body where it's being safe so in our culture um, causes of soul loss would be any kind of abuse emotional physical sexual abuse uh, being in a war having surgery um, being in an accident um, addiction to drugs um, anything that causes shock mm. can cause soul loss and the example I always use is the same if I was going to be in a head-on car collision the very last place I want to be at the point of impact is in my body. Mm -hmm. Our psyche can't endure that kind of pain. So we have a brilliant self-protect mechanism. We go away while that pain is occurring. Many people see themselves on the ceiling while an abuse is going on, looking down at their body, or they're in an altered, peaceful state. They don't feel the full impact of the pain. But what happens is because we no longer look at the loss of the soul as an illness in modern psychology or in modern medicine, you have people who are living outside of themselves. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's yeah. where we're deadened to the beauty of the world, but in a lot of ways we're also deadened to the suffering mm -hmm. because we're not fully in. If you're fully in your body, mm -hmm. you don't put chemicals in the water you drink. Mm -mm. You don't pollute the water you drink. If you're outside of your body and you're dissociated and you're fuzzy all the mm -hmm. time, it's like, oh, okay, the treatment plant is, you know, um, is dumping chemicals in the water. So what? But when you're in, it's like, wait, this doesn't make sense. I need to be drinking clean water to mm -hmm. be healthy. So uh, I think it's important for us to become inspirited, to um, fully um, live in our bodies, which is a vehicle, allow our minds to work with us to help us come up with the solutions for the changes ahead. But first we have to get back in our bodies. And people in our culture, ha we've all suffered trauma. We're mm -hmm. all out there. Yeah, and we all have a <laughs> mechanism to numb ourselves, I exactly. think. Exactly. Should it be with computers or the internet or food mm -hmm. or, you know, just this place where you just decide to go to where there is nothing and right. you just don't. And that's, we need to awaken. That's part of the awakening, isn't it? Absolutely. That's what I hear. Yes. That's Absolutely. really the awakening. We have to get back in our bodies, stop numbing ourselves and go, I mean, what I did in my life, because I realized that I was out of my body most of my life, when I really got in, I had a friend who I taught soul retrieval to, and she did a soul retrieval for me. And she did this soul retrieval for me, and I was like in, completely in my body, you know, everything, the colors were vibrant, and mm. I was so alive. And I remember the moment I made this decision if I'm going to really be in my body, mm -hmm. I want to have a good life. Mm -hmm. I want to make changes in my life, um, in my relationships, and my work, everything that I do that supports um, a healthy existence. Mm. So That's exciting. It was. It was, a, it was a great experience for me because depression was, has always been a lifelong issue oh, for me because even as a child, people used to stop me in the street and they used to tell me their problems and I became so burdened mm. by the pain of other people. And I knew what was causing my depression, but I just didn't know how to lift it. And when I had a soul retrieval, that depression lifted for me. And then of course, you know, my path began of learning how to um, have compassion for suffering, but not to take it all on myself and become burdened by it, which is a work in progress, I can't say, you know, I've perfected it. 
But um, that's good to hear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it it was um, such a gift for me to realize that I could make. Um, choices for myself that were different from my past yeah and I think um, that that's really where people need to start looking at is we do have the potential we can make choices that create a positive present and future for ourselves that are different from all the traumas that we've suffered mm. in, in the past we don't have to keep re recreating the same traumas over and over and over again. Mm. I, I, I really love the, the, the image of having the soul entirely in the body. Not mm -hmm. enough people say that and it makes perfect sense. But d doesn't the soul feel a little bit uh, uh, scared to do that <laughs> or, or is that the ego saying that's, no it won't have enough space? That's the ego. I mean the soul is expansive. Yeah. Very expansive. And but it starts from within instead of... Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things that I um, a simple exercise I try to get people to do, this is really simple, is to imagine yourself merging with a star in the night sky. Mm. And <clears throat> when you merge with a star in the night sky, one of the lessons that you learn is how expansive that light is. I mean, that light shines for, what, millions, billions of miles, mm. but it's effortless. You know, the star's not going, ooh, I have to <laughs> shine today. I'm too tired to shine today, or it's too hard to shine today. It's, it's not a process. Shining your light in the world is not a process that takes effort. Mm -hmm. And when, when you're in touch with that spiritual light inside of yourself, your divinity, and your soul and you're inhabiting your body it becomes just an effortless process and so i give people the practice to merge with a star and feel what it feels like how effortless it is but yet how far mm. that light expands and how then people look up at the beauty of the night sky they never say Ooh, that star shining more than that you know <laughs> <the> star is <laughs> It's just when you see a night sky that's lit up with all the stars, you know, you're just struck in awe mm. with how beautiful. Especially that is. around here. You can oh, yeah, really I see know. them clearly. Wow. I know, that's one of the beauties of Santa Fe. Soul is light. It's the same. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, soul is our essence and it's pure light. It's, it's pure light. It's pure divinity. So one of the changes that I've made in, in teaching soul retrieval and doing soul retrievals on people is after, before I, I actually blow the soul into people, I give them the instruction to think about a metaphor that would allow them to absorb the light of their soul into every cell of their being, mm. like a, sp a dry sponge that's been put in water or a flower that's been in the rain too long and the sun comes out and it <laughs> takes in that sun or the opposite, a flower that's been in the sun too long and a rain comes down and you know takes mm. that in. Um, because as we can absorb that light of our soul into every cell of our being, um, we feel inspirited, we feel that inner joy, we feel that wholeness and yet we also feel a connection to the rest of life too. Mm. And then again, we can be at better service for the earth right now, our planet that really needs it. Right, right now, you're saying it's about community, it's about us shining our soul, it's about bringing back our soul into our body and really mm. being present to what's happening so that we can really be there. Right, and you know, healing is about being able to radiate love really open up our hearts not from an inauthentic real authentic loving life and all of life and and the beauty and the gift of being here on this planet and then recognizing that we're body mind and spirit and the spiritual part of ourselves is that light that radiates that light that shines and so um, part of being a shining light in the world is what are we transmitting? What are the thoughts, what are the words, what are the energies that we're transmitting into the world? 
And, you know, for some people I can say, well, is that enough? And when I've done radio interviews, people say to me, aren't you being a little Pollyanna, you know, that we change our thoughts and the world around us changes. And yes, there are behavioral changes that we have to make, but um, we, our outer world really is a reflection of our inner state. And that is, if you look at um, the spiritual teachings of all cultures and where miracles come from, mm -hmm. light heals, light heals. And when, if you go back into uh, the stories of the Bible and Jesus um, transfiguring into a brighter light than had ever been seen before, um, when you, you see some of the miracles that have come about in different cultures, um, a spiritual master will look like the radi radiation of the Buddha or the divine light coming through an Indian mystic like Amici, who's mm. known for her miraculous healings. I haven't found a culture that does not uh, look at miraculous healings of a being radiating light mm -hmm. and love. Mm. Um, and that's where the healing comes from. And if we could be that presence in the world, we could heal through our presence. And anybody who's in a healing tradition knows it's not methods that heal, it's love that heals, it's the presence that heals. When people are in the presence of a true healer, or a true mystic, they're transformed by the light they're radiating, by the love they're radiating, by the presence mm -hmm. of that person. That's where true healing, and we all have that ability, but we have to do the alchemy of the soul. Yeah. We have to work through those dense, dark states of consciousness mm -hmm. into those gold light states of consciousness. It starts with paying attention, being conscious of our thoughts, um, being conscious of the words we're using, being conscious of being in gratitude, yeah. and merging with a star. Imagine yourself merging with a star and walking around. That's where we light. come from, isn't it? That's right, yeah. You work a lot. I know a friend of mine actually from Michigan had worked with you on some workshops for heart attack. You worked for some heart attack patients. Yes. What do you do with them? <clears throat> well, we're, we're really excited because um, finally the study is, is um, going to be published. Good. And I basically, um, what I did was I taught them that they're more than a body and uh, their mind and how to tap back into their divine light, um, how to start with their uh, practice, working with their words and, and their thoughts and, and perceiving themselves as healthy and not ill. Because when you do spiritual work, you're dancing this paradox all the time because there's the, the egoic part of ourselves that lives in separation. Mm -hmm. And it's that part that perceives illness. But when you transcend to a spiritual state of consciousness, everything is perfection. And so we're constantly dancing back and forth between those realms. So I, I taught the group how to um, perceive themselves in their divine perfection, start to work with reframing their thoughts and attitudes and their words, and um, taught them about how to actually see, hear, feel, taste, smell their whole life as if they're living it in a joyful, healthy fashion. And we really got some great results. Mm -hmm. um, people did really well with the work. And now there's a whole study and a report and some mm -hmm. things that are coming out soon? Yes. Uh -huh. To show that, to show yes. their progress also? Right, yeah. Yeah. So what are some of the, just if you can point at some of the changes that you saw that really touched you? Well, um, you're like, wow, this is actually happening. Because <laughs> well, you must be surprised yourself, too, yeah, I'm sure. Well, or I, I wasn't surprised because I believe in the work. <laughs> so every cell of my being, I, I believe in the work. Um, part of the, the um, challenge for me in the study was that it was a randomized study and most of my group, 97% of my group, ended up being fundamentalist Christians. So it was how to bring oh, wow. my work in mm. and use the languaging 
mm -hmm. that would um, help them to embrace the work and not get stuck on certain wording that would push them away from, mm. from the work. So that, that was a, um, a challenging part for me, but it was also an exciting part for me of, you can bring spiritual practices into any community if you just don't get attached to the wording that mm. you use. So um, one story was a man who, um, he, uh, he was a minister, is a minister, and um, his doctor, after the study was over, he went to his doctor and his doctor said to him, well, I have good news and I have bad news for you. And he, you know, based on what I had said, mm -hmm. I only want the good news. I don't want to hear the bad news. <laughs> don't plant seeds of fear into me. And he said, well, the bad news is we no longer have a diagnosis for you anymore. The good news is, is you've rehealed um, mm. the arteries in your heart. Mm. And so this is just one story that wow. came out. How long does this. it take him? Well, we did a, we actually did a four day workshop and really focused on different practices and the group working together in behalf, really, um, really supporting the whole entire group in their healing, not just personal healing, but, you know, we really cared about the healing of every uh, so really bringing the community. Really bringing That's the important, community. Huh, in the healing it's very at that level. It's very important because what I found in my work over the years is that once you bring community in, um, you get exponential results than what one person can do on their own. And that's one of the points that I'm trying to make right now is if as a global community, if we could get people really focused on um, radiating their light and not focusing so much on what isn't working but working on creating the world that they want to you know it it makes it's just exponential of the change that we see so it was exciting to be able to um, work with this study and until the study is published there's only so much I can actually say about it, which is why I'm kind of watching my words. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that um, people got um, in our group was hope. And, and that's something that is very important when we're dealing with healing. Mm -hmm. um, because if a person has no hope, it's going to affect the results. It's more than the belief if I can heal. It's if you can even keep a sense of hope. Mm -hmm. And that was something that uh, came out of this study. So it's like you plant a little sparkle in there mm -hmm. that can then, of light, <laughs> that can then expand and grow right. and heal. Right. Yeah, I think um, so much of my work is about teaching people how to be gardeners. Be uh, gardeners of the planet. Yeah. You know, how do you treat mm. a garden so that it's healthy? but how to uh, rework our inner gardens, how to pull out um, the weeds and the plants that have grown so deep, the roots are so deep of our old beliefs, our old traumas, our attitudes, our negative thinking, um, our feelings of separation towards each other and the rest of life, and how to rework that mm -hmm. and plant the seeds of hope and inspiration and love and light so that's what grows out of us mm -hmm. and that's what our world will reflect back to us thank you so much sandra yeah. for this moment it was so special thank you yeah, and i'm sure everybody thanks. watching really enjoyed that thanks thank you and thanks for bringing all of this to uh our global community. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Because we have the power to create change right now. Yes, we do. Yeah. I really am really, really present to that right now. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, much love, my beautiful co-creator. And if you want to see more interviews, you can check JuicyLivingTour.com. Much love. It's really important where we live to have some kind of sacred space, something that reminds you of spirituality. And every time you make a change in your life, it's important to keep changing your altars oh. uh, because it reflects those changes. And so... We're right now in your office. So right now we're in my office and I've got some That's crystals that are very meaningful to me. Uh, snake skin that reminds me mm. of my connection with the earth. 
Um, I've taken groups to Egypt and love um, the Egyptian gods and goddesses, so I have different statues in honor of them that uh, remind me of the magic that's possible in life. Mm -hmm. um, and of course I have my stuffed animals from when these are actually from when I was a little kid. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, all these objects have some meaning for me that remind me of my spiritual connections, that I'm not alone, that um, there's a lot of help. I love rattles. I love going into <laughs> altered states, listening to rattles. Oh, yeah. So I collect rattles that have different sounds that go along with them. Well, thank you. Yeah.